Welcome back to the AI Breakdown. One of the things that is almost guaranteed to get people in the artificial intelligence space excited is when we get real powerful foundation model developments. GPT 3.5 and then GPT 4 obviously kicked off a lot of what has been this AI boom this year. But then more recently, Llama 2 coming out and being a very powerful open source-ish model has really been an energizer for the space. What's more, as you've heard on recent episodes, there is a ton of rumor and intrigue around Google Gemini, which they are very clearly trying to position, at least behind the scenes, as a GPT-4 killer, given how much compute they're using to train it. Well, today we got another model, and people's first impressions are, well, impressed. Hyperwrite CEO Matt Schumer says, This is shocking. Falcon 180B has been released. Trained on 4x the compute of Llama 2 70B, it sits between GPT-3.5 and GPT-4 in terms of capabilities. We're now less than two months away from GPT-4-level open-source models. So what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about this new release in Falcon 180B, and then what it means in terms of the larger open-source conversation. And then we'll talk about what it means in the context of the debate around whether these super-powerful advanced models should be open-source. First, let's go to the blog post on Hugging Face called Spread Your Wings, Falcon 180B is here. The post kicks off. Today, we're excited to welcome TII's Falcon 180B to Hugging Face. Falcon 180B sets a new state of the art for open models. It's the largestly open available language model with 180 billion parameters and was trained on a massive 3.5 trillion tokens. This represents the longest single epic pre-training for an open model. In terms of capabilities, Falcon 180B achieves state-of-the-art results across natural language tasks. It tops the leaderboard for pre-trained open access models and rivals proprietary models like Palm 2. While difficult to rank definitively yet, it is considered on par with Palm 2 Large, making Falcon 180B one of the most capable LLMs publicly known. Now, Falcon is the latest in a series of open models that have come from TII. Hugging Face writes that architecture-wise, Falcon 180B is a scaled-up version of Falcon 40B and builds on its innovations such as multi-query attention for improved scalability. The training dataset, they say, consists predominantly of web data from refined web around 85%. In addition, it has been trained on a mix of curated data such as conversations, technical papers, and a small fraction of code, around 3%. Now, when it comes to how good Falcon 180B is, they say... Falcon 180B is the best openly released LLM today, outperforming Llama 270B and OpenAI's GPT 3.5 on MMLU. Now, in more practical terms for the average listener, quote, Falcon 180B typically sits somewhere between GPT 3.5 and GPT 4, depending on the evaluation benchmark, and further fine-tuning from the community will be very interesting to follow now that it's openly released. Another measure which Falcon 180B tops is the Hugging Face leaderboard. Its leaderboard score is 68.74, which comes ahead of Llama 2's 67.35. Now, the rest of the blog post has lots of information about how to actually use it, where to test it, where to demo it. But the really interesting piece that I want to return to is again from Matt Schumer's tweet, where he says we're now less than two months away from GPT-4 level open source models. Now, admittedly, when someone asked him where he pulled the two months from, Matt said, just a guess based on watching the space progress over the last few years. But for the sake of our conversation, let's not get caught up in these specifics and more in the point that he's trying to make, which is that we are very, very close to GPT-4 level open source models, which seems at this point with the release of Falcon 180B pretty certifiably true. Now, the competition between closed source models and open source models has been a key theme of the entire year. One of the most read and referenced documents of the year has to be the internal memo that was leaked from Google called We Have No Moat and Neither Does OpenAI. The document, which was published on Semi Analyst, basically argued that what companies like Google and OpenAI hadn't anticipated is the extent to which people would be able to make advances with publicly available open source models. Now, they attributed a lot of that to the full leak of Facebook's Llama model. But regardless of the reason, the author said things we considered major open problems are solved and in people's hands today. Plainly put, they are lapping us. What's more, that was before Llama 2 was released with a commercially available version. And rumors are that Meta is also speeding ahead with their next models. A number of times I've quoted a tweet from Jason at AGI Koala who said, Overheard at a Meta Gen AI social. We have compute to train Llama 3 and 4. The plan is for Llama 3 to be as good as GPT-4. When asked if they would still open source it if it was that good, the Meta person said, Yeah, we will. Sorry, alignment people. Now, this is where we intersect with this debate around whether these frontier models should be released in open source. 
More recent commentary on that came from Mustafa Suleiman, again from the 80,000 Hours podcast that I quoted recently. On that show, he said, I think I've come out quite clearly pointing out the risks of large-scale access. I think I called it naive open source in 20 years' time. So what that means is if we just continue to open source absolutely everything for every new generation of frontier models, then it's quite likely that we're going to see a rapid proliferation of power. These are state-like powers which enable small groups of actors or maybe even individuals to have an unprecedented one-to-many impact in the world. Just as the last wave of social media enabled anyone to have broadcast powers, anybody to essentially function as an entire newspaper from the 90s, by the 2000s you could have millions of followers on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, and you're really influencing the world. In a way that was previously the preserve of a publisher that in most cases was licensed and regulated, That was an authority that could be held accountable if it did something really egregious. And all of that has now kind of fallen away. For good reasons, by the way, and in some cases with bad consequences. We're going to see the same trajectory with respect to access to the ability to influence the world. You can think of it as related to my modern Turing test that I proposed around artificial capable AI. Like machines that go from being evaluated on the basis of what they say, you know, the imitation test of the original Turing test, to evaluating machines on the basis of what they can do. Can they use APIs? How persuasive are they of other humans? Can they interact with other AIs to get them to do things? So if everybody gets that power, that starts to look like individuals having the power of organizations or even states. I'm talking about models that are two or three or maybe four orders of magnitude on from where we are. And we're not far away from that. We're going to be training models that are 1,000x larger than they currently are in the next three years. Even at inflection with the compute that we have, we'll be 100x larger than the current Frontier models in the next 18 months. Although I took a lot of heat on the open source thing, I clearly wasn't talking about today's models. I was talking about future generations, and I still think it's right and I stand by that. Because I think that if we don't have the conversation, then we end up basically putting massively chaotic destabilizing tools in the hands of absolutely everybody. How you do that in practice, somebody referred to it like trying to catch rainwater or trying to stop rain by catching it in your hands, which I think is a very good rebuttal. It's absolutely spot on. Of course this is insanely hard. I'm not saying that it's not difficult. I'm saying that it's the conversation we need to be having. Now, interestingly, another former Googler, Eric Schmidt, shared similar concerns recently on CNN. He said, discussing his belief that within five years, AI will start self-improving entirely on their own, Schmidt said, that's a very, very big change in history. Until now, the tools we've built have been under our control. What really worries me is diffusion from the very, very powerful models to the next tier open source models. You're building a system that is open source so anyone can get access to it, but you don't know what it can do. What happens if it builds a pathogen, which gets in the hands of an Osama bin Laden type person, and that pathogen can kill a million people? So you say, no problem, we'll put guardrails on it, alignment, to prevent it from being misused. But if you open source it and I'm evil, I can strip the restraints off. I'm concerned the AIs will have polymathic capabilities to allow someone who doesn't have a PhD in biology and is evil to really harm people. Imagine if one of these things learns how to get access to weapons. Open source AI will be too dangerous, too powerful to be unmonitored. Now, I think that the problem with the state of this open source conversation right now is that on the one hand, you have a fundamental assumption, a nigh unchallengeable assumption, that the world is better off if all technology is open source. That open source is a bulwark against the concentration of power. It's understandable where this perspective comes from, because in many cases it is, and it has been. But to folks who are concerned about these issues, it can seem like a blind, unconsidered assumption that open source is right, and open source is good a priori, no matter what the context. On the flip side, however, people who are broadly in support of open source models, and who think that they are part of the answer to the problems of AI, are concerned that the safety folks, for their part, fail to recognize the threat of concentration of power when it comes to these incredibly advanced systems. Now, adding an additional dimension on top of all of this is the fact that anyone who is in a big tech company setting is assumed to be just looking who is against open sourcing of advanced models, is assumed to be simply about regulatory capture and pulling up the ladder, and taking that position only because they want to be the ones to economically benefit from AI rather than sharing the benefits far and wide. Now, I think many of you smart, nuanced, thoughtful, non-biased thinkers will see points to recommend all of these positions. And so the question, of course, is how we reconcile them, how we sort it out. One path forward that I see is in getting more granular. In that interview with 80,000 Hours, Mustafa Suleiman says, I clearly wasn't talking about today's model. I was talking about future generations. But that wasn't clear to people. It wasn't clear at all. And what we might need is to get that type of clarity and stop talking vaguely about, for example, future generations and start trying to answer collectively questions like, what would be too powerful to release openly? What are the capacities that are too risky to be open source? 
And what does that say about the development of those models in general? Of course, you very quickly get to a conversation about how closed source models are developed and released as well, which is of course a part of the conversation that we need to have. The point is, and you will hear me harken back to this fairly frequently, good conversations about AI policy and just about societal norms and expectations around this new technology are going to come from moving from the very general to the much more specific. I think we are now at that time where instead of just vaguely pointing to futures, it behooves us to get specific about the implications of different capabilities and futures that we find concerning or not and try to act accordingly based on that. Because as Falcon 180B once again reminds us, even when things feel quiet and calm and low ebb, they are moving faster than just about anyone would have imagined even just a couple years ago. So friends, lots of food for thought. But for now, given that we aren't at those advanced models, I think it's pretty exciting to see the development of Falcon 180B, and I'm really excited to see what people build on it. If you want to come proffer a theory for at what level of capability models should no longer be open sourced, or alternatively, an argument for why at any level of capability the world is better if they are released as open source, come join the Breakers Discord, bit.ly slash AI Breakdown. I'll see you there. Until next time, guys. Peace.